I'm Steve Bijou, and this is Down Home Corner. I grew up in the Maritimes, a place rich with stories and storytelling, and I realized everybody has a story, and we are all connected. In this episode, we take a trip in the Wayback Machine and dust off a couple of stories and an interview I did in 2005 with Campbellton's Steve Hennessy. Steve was then on tour with Sarah McLaughlin for her Afterglow album. He was drum technician for Ashwin Sood, who was at that time Sarah's drummer and husband, although he's left both positions since. Now, just a note, a couple of things that we talk about in the interview are now dated, but instead of editing them out like I thought of originally, I just decided to leave them in because, well, it's kind of fun now seeing where we are and where we were then. Anyway, there's some fun things in here and there's some fun stories and I hope you enjoy it. So let's kick back and listen to Steve Hennessy. Well, Steve, you've seen the world over the last year and a half from New York City to Sydney, Australia, Amsterdam, Ireland, Toronto, and you've done it on tour with someone as great as Sarah McLaughlin, you know, a a great songwriter, an amazing performer, a philanthropist. How cool is that, anyway? Uh, I I can't describe how cool it is. It's it's, uh, for me to to be doing what I love to do, which is to, to be around music starting out as a musician and now doing this, uh, I couldn't ask for anything better. It's a wonderful w- way to see the world and to meet people. W- what else can I say about it? Uh, Europe this past fall was, was incredible to, to, to go to places I'd never been to before. And then now, uh, just finishing up through America, we did most places last year, but now we just played Madison Square Gardens in New York. Uh, uh, this uh, Right before we play Moncton, we're doing the uh, Trump uh, Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. So it's just... It's just kind of almost surreal uh, for for the most part, but it's just wonderful. I get to do what I love. I do it every day. I work with great people, and uh, what more could I ask for? And then don't let Donald Trump fire you because it's not official. Remember that. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, besides, uh, somebody else would have to fire me. <laughs> I like your <laughs> I like your pecking order over there. Listen, yeah. for somebody who's who's going to the show in Moncton or St. John on Monday or Tuesday, let's say they're a big fan and they've never seen a Sarah McLaughlin show. What would you say they're in for? Well, you would be one of many because uh, Sarah's not done a whole lot of shows in the Maritimes. Uh, uh, I believe not since her travel, uh, uh, fumbling towards ecstasy tour, uh, that she's not been back. So I, I know a lot of people are looking forward to seeing her show. Uh, without without giving any uh, surprises away, uh, you're just in for a treat. It, it's uh, people that I've talked to who have seen her show uh, said it's it's almost uh, it's a cleansing experience. It's uh, it's uh, it's emotional. It's spiritual. It's uh, it's everything you'd expect in a in a Sarah McLachlan show and more. Like there's some surprises. She does a couple great uh, covers uh, of uh, artists that she admires. Um, uh, yeah, the, the set is beautiful. Uh, there's a nice flow between all the songs. Uh, there's a little of everything from her last three albums. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I started out as a fan uh, back in the uh, mid '90s, and uh, now to to have seen her show and to have seen it night after night, it still it still moves me. And and the energy that that she gets off the audience is like just recently, about a week and a half ago, we played Montreal, and and the energy in there was like the the Canadians had just won the Stanley Cup. It was just over the top. And once again, comparable to to last summer, out of the whole tour we did, these were some of our best uh, audiences were were in Canada, like Toronto and Montreal. Toronto, uh, Montreal, though, like I say, just won it over over the top two times in a row now. And I'm expecting uh, the Maritimes will be as good because she's not been there in a long time, and there's a lot of people who uh, who miss her, a lot of her her hometown fans from uh, Nova Scotia. I'm sure are totally looking forward to seeing the show. Now, Steve, with the tour winding down, it, it's been a long, you know, a long road, so to speak. No pun intended. Are you glad it's over, or will you miss being on the road with Sarah and Ashwin? Uh, I, I mean, it'll be nice to have some time off after this, because that's why <laughs> that's why it's coming to a close. Because most uh, most people, including uh, Sarah and Ash, need to to get on with a personal life. But a lot of us will be going on to uh, the, some of the guys have already left the midway <laughs> through this tour to uh, to go off to like. Avril Lavigne, and there's a couple other artists that uh, that are out there right now that uh, that have a lot of the same uh, crew. Uh, but no, myself, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to having a bit of time to get back to music, and uh, you know, potentially through the summer. There's a couple other artists that I've worked for in the past, like Matthew Good, who uh, who is uh, apparently going to go out and do some shows in Ontario in 
in July that I'll have the opportunity to probably go and work with again because they're old friends of mine now. And and then uh, my band rhymes with orange. I, I hope to get and get back with those guys and spend some time in Vancouver, just just putting uh, my ear to the guitar and uh, and have a bit of fun with that also. So what's the hardest part of being a drum technician on a tour this size? Uh, is is it a, a difficult job or just tedious kind of thing? Uh, it's it's funny because the, the the difficult part of the job isn't necessarily what I have to do every day. That 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 almost becomes uh, like the movie Groundhog's Day. You find yourself doing the same thing over and over every day, and you turn to the guy working next to you and you go, "Didn't we do this yesterday?" <laughs> but <laughs> but that's part of this part of the game. It's just like uh, as long as I mean, knock on wood, that everything just goes as as it does the previous day. But then daily you encounter little things like oh. Uh, a nut or a bolt is getting loose on this, so I got to tighten that up, or I got to uh, order another spare part, or you know, get a different cable in uh, to replace one that's starting to go faulty. Those are kind of your daily maintenances. Uh, on above and beyond that kind of thing, what I do for Ashwin is uh, is sort of look out for our uh, our suppliers in different cities. So people who help us out along the way with like his drum heads or his cymbals or his drumsticks. Uh, Ash has enough to worry about that. I try and keep in contact with these people over the internet or calling them, and then I invite them out to the shows that we're coming into. So it helps Ash have one less thing to worry about. And then, of course, it's good uh, relationship uh, between him and, and his uh, and his suppliers. So it's little things like that that uh, that I feel more the the personal pressure of just trying to be as as good as and an efficient. Uh, personal assistant for ash uh, uh, above and beyond just being a drum tech you know when, when he comes in he goes you know how's it going partner it's basically that's what it's come down to i take care of that part of his world and and then he takes care of his <laughs> personal life and being a father and being a drummer on stage so it's 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 fun and then I, I i personally enjoy doing that being a musician i know i know the insight into what it's like to already have enough on your plate that all you want to do when you walk in at night is play your instrument and not worry about anything else, and he leaves that to me, and it's and it's a it's a nice responsibility. It's a nice little trust uh, thing going on with you guys. Totally, totally, totally. He said to me last uh, September after we came off uh, last year's tour, we had a afterglow rap party in Vancouver, and uh, he just said, oh, "I hope you're you're in for the long haul because uh, you know I'll be doing this for a while, and I love working with you." And I was like, "Oh, I ain't going anywhere." So. So I, I figured he meant more than just uh, the year and a half. <laughs> That's great. That's good to hear. Now yeah. I don't want I don't want to put any words in your mouth here with highlights, but just a couple of weeks ago in Memphis, you met, you found out Elvis was alive, and also you met Elvis's daughter too, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so that that was probably one of the highlights of the of the tour, just because of who we were on the bill with. It was. Uh, it was a beautiful Sunday, uh, sunny Sunday along the Mississippi River in Memphis, Tennessee, and we were doing a uh, street festival that, that included bands like the Black Crows, Billy Idol, uh, The Roots, uh, to, to name just a few. I mean, pre previous to that day, there was Collective Soul and a whole bunch of other bands. But the, our specific day had the lineup I just mentioned, and one of them, the band right before us, was Elvis Costello. Oh, that and Elvis. Then, and then during the day... Uh, one of the performers was Lisa Marie Presley, so I, I really felt like there was a connection there between seeing a pre uh, uh, an Elvis and a Presley in Memphis on a beautiful s a spring Sunday. It was just incredible. Wow. Was incredible. Any gigs you'd like to forget? Anything? I mean, no, not necessarily negative, but things that just weren't going the way you wanted them to, like anything that stands out? I mean, w when you think of those gigs, it it's, it's not so much the gig itself. It it's often uh, a tainted unfairly because of technical reasons either because of a really bad loadout or something uh it's the sydney the opera house in sydney australia beautiful venue world-class venue uh they've got uh, they've got shows going on every day there but the loadout uh was a bit of a nightmare for us the uh, the freight elevator broke down so most of our things like the grand piano uh just don't fit into any ele uh, elevator so here you are at uh, 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night, they have to call in the repairman. And in between that time, then we're going to all the small little pedestrian elevators that we can find, uh, uh, sort of flushing all our smaller equipment down through eight different elevators. So it just takes an extra hour and a half to two hours before we can get everything out of there. So it's things like that where you go, well, great gig, but bad, uh, bad technical uh, venue, just, just from our perspective. Uh, but beyond that, I mean... God, uh, uh, every venue is, is, is great on its own. Europe, once again, falls into uh, the same category of, like, a lot of 
hard load ins. Uh, sometimes you you you're, have to load up a hill, a cobblestone hill <laughs> to an alley, you know, that wasn't designed back in the 1800s or 1700s to have bands loading through. But once you get in there and then you see what the theater looks like, and it's just incredible, uh, you, you can't help but be moved. Any place on the tour remind you of home, like Hamilton or Athelville or anything that kind of triggered a memory of back home at all? Well, I tell you, when you travel, uh, once again, through Europe, you realize just where our ancestors come from. So it's nice to see the sort of uh, Celtic uh, uh, maritime, uh, I don't know, like uh, one of the places I felt at home, uh, and meanwhile is quite far away from here, is, uh, is uh, Dublin, Ireland. But Ireland just has this vibe of, of what we get in the Maritimes and, and like Newfoundland and Cape Breton and, and we do in Nova Scotia. So I couldn't, felt like, uh, I couldn't help but feel at home there. Uh, and then uh, to the other extremity, to go to Paris, once again, you got that French vibe. And, and fortunate for us in Camelton, we've got both, both extremities. We've got the English and the French. So uh, it's really nice to see where we come from when, when you get outside the box and, uh, and see, see some of our ancestors. <laughs> Well, it's nice with the tour ending up kind of in, in both of Sarah's homes, where she came from originally in, in the East Coast, and then now her, her latest home, which is in Vancouver. So the, the whole leg of the tour ends up in, in both ends of the country like that. That's really cool. Uh, is, is there any chance that uh, you might go back on tour again with her on the next one, or has there been any talk when that might be, or exactly what's good? She's going to take some time off, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, well... Uh, the way that the Sarah Camp works, uh, everybody that I work for in in the uh, in the technical uh, technical department have been with her from the very beginning. Like she's got uh, band members and, and crew that have been with her all through her career. So it's almost like a band when it starts out and it travels in a van with a trailer. Well, a lot of these people are the same people. Uh, so unless I have reason to to look elsewhere, uh, it's nice now to be included in this family. That's that's forever growing, and and every time, uh, it, like a lot of these people hadn't worked with her since uh, Lilith Fair, and then there was a um, cancer benefit that uh, we did about two years ago in Vancouver. Uh, Jan Arden, Brian Adams, Bare Naked Ladies, and Sarah played, and even for the one-off, they called in a lot of the same people came in, did the one show, and then fast forward two years later, uh, a lot of the same people or all of the same people are all called back. So uh, so, and then with myself living in Vancouver. Uh, Ash knows that he can call me at any time and uh, and have me come over and help him out in the studio or or tech his drum kit for whatever needs he needs. Uh, uh, that's the other beauty of of living in Vancouver and network management. Uh, when they hire people, that's something that they always looked at uh, from the get go is to have people uh, who live in Vancouver, not necessarily from Vancouver, because that would almost be uh, discrim- discriminative. But uh, people who live there, there's an advantage to. Uh, there's always maybe something going on, and and if Sarah decides to. You know, like the tsunami uh, uh, disaster when that uh, struck. We were in in our vacation period before we went back out to Australia. But uh, Sarah and Ash, uh, uh, the the morning of, her manager uh, Terry McBride was on the phone and called uh, um, uh, Sarah and asked her what she thought. And she's like, "Yes, whatever we can do." And that's that's what they did. And you know, within two weeks, they put together a huge uh, concert that raised a lot of money for for the relief. So those are the kind of things that. Uh, I can always expect to, uh, you know, stand by and, and wait because those things could come up, and uh, and that's when people get called back into work. It sounds so great. It must have been a great year and a half, and uh, I know you look forward to going back on tour with it again. Just quickly before we go, Steve, what do you want to do when you get back? What's the first thing you want to do when you get back to Northern New Brunswick? Oh, geez, the top three are always, you know. Have a poutine, have a good donair, or have a great lobster. <laughs> well, I'll buy the donair for you, but uh, I'm not into seafood. They they kicked me out of the East Coast originally, and it took me years to get back in again. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're having a great time on the tour, and uh, well, we're looking thank you. looking forward to seeing the show in Moncton and uh, St. John as well, and uh, looking forward to the next round after that. Yeah, same here, same here. I look forward to seeing you there, and uh, well, I look forward to coming back to Camelton. Uh, I'll, I'll see you then, also. Great talking to you, Steve. Thanks. Same to you. Take care. You know, I came across this interview quite by accident, quite by chance. I didn't even know I still had a copy of it. And when I listened to it, it triggered a flood of memories. At that time, of course, Steve was touring with Sarah McLaughlin, and since then, he's gone on to work with Michael Buble and The Great Prince, among others. But this really took me back a few years. 
Now, to fill you in, I had done this interview with Steve, and then he arranged for backstage passes uh, for me and a guest. At that time, it was my best friend, John Van Zeelen, who was my sidekick and perfect companion on the trip, because John had worked many concerts and shows in Toronto. And he worked as a roadie and technician for a number of bands. So he understood a bit of what was going on. And he was helping to teach me some of the things that were happening that I might have been missing looking straight at. For instance, we were waiting for Steve after the show. And John was explaining some things about what was going on on stage as they were tearing it apart. And he would say things like, you see all the people in the green t-shirts on stage? Well, they're locals. They have been hired just for this show. You see the people on stage in the yellow t-shirts. Well, they're part of the road crew. They go from town to town with the band. Those big road cases? Well, the ones labeled P, for example, would be everything to do with the piano. So, everything that goes with the piano goes in a road case marked P. The cases with the letter D, for example, are drums. Everything down to the drumsticks, anything to do with drums, will go in a case marked D, and on and on. Another great memory was before the show started, we had hooked up with Earl Hennessy, Steve's dad, who had traveled from Camelton also to see the Sarah McLaughlin show and meet up with Steve. Well, we met up with Earl outside Moncton Coliseum, and as we were looking for a crew member to find Steve, they took us onto the tour bus. We got to wait on the tour bus, and let me tell you, if you ever have to travel by bus, this is the way to go if you ever want to go in style and comfort. I even thought about maybe stowing away on the bus. I didn't want to leave. It was so nice. So Steve was located. He met us at the tour bus, and we all exchanged pleasantries. And then he brought us out to meet Ashwin Sood, the drummer. Well, I found Ashwin very friendly, very humble, and down to earth. Well, Steve said, I've got a few things to do, but if you guys would like, you can watch the sound check. We thought that was pretty cool, so we went to watch the sound check, and it was surreal. Here's the scene. While roadies are setting up chairs still in the back few rows, about seven of us are settled five to ten rows away from the stage as Sarah McLaughlin and her amazing band play three songs just for us. Now try and picture that if you're a fan. It didn't suck. We even got a laugh ahead of time just as the first song began because the crew boss comes up and he turns to Earl and he says, Excuse me. And Earl says, Yes. He says, You can't be sitting here. You got to get back to work. There's a slight pause and then we all burst out laughing. Earl calmly and coolly says, No, I'm Earl. I'm Steve Hennessy's father. Who? The crew boss says. He's Ashwin's drum technician. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake, my mistake. Sorry, sir. And then another burst of laughter. Well, believe it or not, just before the sound check, Earl had told us the story, that very same thing happening to him in Montreal during a sound check. Earl says, this guy's an idiot. It's the same guy from Montreal. Then we burst out laughing again. Well, it was an amazing show, and a one-of-a-kind experience, and a memory that I'll always cherish. Sadly, John and Earl have since passed away. They're no longer with us, but they were both such great guys. Uh, everybody loved John. Everybody loved Earl. You just couldn't not like these guys. But I'd like to think that John is in rock and roll heaven, and he's backstage at an Elvis concert, and he's located Timothy Leary, and they're having a conversation about LSD. And I'd like to think that Earl has met up with Arnold Palmer and they're shooting 18 holes somewhere. And it's no understatement to say John Van Zelen and Earl Hennessy will always be missed. But I'll always remember that fun time in 2005 thanks to Sarah McLaughlin and Steve Hennessy. And I hope you enjoyed this little journey through the interview archives along with a couple of little stories and a bit of reminiscing. Join us next time on Down Home Corner. I'm Steve Vigio reminding you, everybody has a story, and we are all connected.